Very well. I'm happy to see everybody back um, at PM 307, Ministerial Ethics, Week 3. Um, it's quite a decent subject. We just spoke about that before you entered, about the um, ethics behind ministry. Um, there's so much ethics involved in ministry. I mean, it's unbelievable. If you, if you do things unethically, <laughs> it will bite you somewhere, you know, at the somewhere backside, you know. Uh, and that's the problem with um, with us. We we try to intervene, and then we you know take care of things unethically, and of course that will create lots of pain for 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 you personally, but also for the ministry in large. So um, yes, I'm going to pray and ask God to bless us, and then of course I will share my class with you tonight. Heavenly Father, Almighty God, we glorify you because you are Alpha and Omega. You are beginning and end. There's so many things you have taught us through Scripture and through these lectures. My prayer is to God that you will bless us, that you will give us wisdom to take care of the ministry as we're supposed to take care of the ministry, not as we would like, but as you would like. In Jesus' name, amen. So um, <clears throat> I hope you are on target with all of your documents, the paperwork, the paperwork, and so on, because um, the bachelor's degree students are running to the end of their year um we still have i think three lessons um it's coming yeah three lessons that's coming we've got the um chaplaincy chaplaincy one two and three now most of you have done chaplaincy one two and three so it will be easy for you i guess if we can we can finish before our united states school um, ends their year in may so i guess we can finish around about the same time it would mean that um, chaplaincy tonight will finish with ministerial ethics. Then we'll move to the next course, and we still have free to, to go. So it would mean that by I think by May month we'll be finished by that with, with that. So you can graduate then with the other schools all over the all over the world. But um, this course, of course, has also three credit hours, as you know. Um, the course text is the ministerial ethics by Joe E. Troll and James E. Carter. The course requirements, you should read your text, um, attend the class, uh, write a term paper. Remember, when you attend classes, and uh, it gives you also a good marking on your score sheet, because there is three ways we score attendance, term paper, and, of course, exam. Now, exam counts about 60% and 20% for term paper and 20% for um, the, um, let me just switch this thing off, 20% for the um, class attendance. So, yes, um, if people watch online on, on over YouTube, that's also fine. The, the, the campus, the main campus gave permission for that. So, yes, you'll have to complete your exam. I guess if, if I finish tonight, I can send you the links for the exam. That's not a problem. Um, and then, of course, I'll wait for your term papers um, until mid-March, mid round about there, if you haven't completed it by next week. <laughs> you can still take some time of that, no problem. So, yes, um, let me share share my screen with you. I see I didn't share my screen uh, from current slide. <clears throat> there we go. So um, what we'll be doing is um, we're going to finalize our ministerial ethics program. And then um, you can implement this also in your leadership in your church with no cost because it's going to be your own um you know, ethics, you're going to teach them. The course objective remains the same. This course will teach you as a minister how to live and lead others in the ways of the Lord. And this is kind of, you know, how to train people, how to be disciples. I mean, that's quite easy. Ministerial ethics begins with ministerial integrity, which can be defined as completeness or wholeness. Now, if you haven't experienced completeness in your ministry or wholeness for that matter, you haven't seen the real deal, of ministerial integrity um, because that's where you want to be. You want to have completeness. When you wake up in the morning in ministry, you don't want to wonder what's going to happen today. You want to have make a good decision and a person who's got a whole heart, who's got wholeness, can make better decisions. This course will cover one of the most important aspects of ministry. The ministry is all about leading men and women to Jesus. This course will teach you in the ministry um, how to live and lead others also in the ways of the Lord. Now, for tonight, we're going to see economic responsibilities 
And if, um, if we finish with this, we can also do the last one. Ministers are called to engage. You'll find this on page 35, by the way. Uh, ministers are called to engage the full expanse of human relationships and responsibilities, including the, the critically important area of economic life. Now, the significance of economic responsibility is underwritten by two realities. Now, these two realities are set down here. The first one <clears throat> is the central place of economic responsibility in Scripture. It seems important. There's, there's no marking with that, but I know it's not going to be in your test probably. But it's important to note that, you know, <clears throat> this, it's the central place of economic responsibility in Scripture. In the Sermon on the Mount, on, on the Mount, Matthew 5 to 7, Jesus teaches his followers to not store up treasures on earth. In specifically verse 19. Now, and that no one can serve two masters at all. Jesus said in verse 24, you cannot serve God and wealth. And some other translation, he calls it mammon. You cannot serve both. He teaches his followers first to seek God's kingdom and his righteousness, and all the other things. All, all the other things will be given you as well. So the first thing we have to seek is the kingdom of God. I mean, we need to seek God's kingdom and His righteousness. We cannot seek our own righteousness because we do not have any. You can read that in Matthew 6 verse 33. Even when we go to 1 Timothy 6 verse 9, but let's read the whole part. Well, let's, let's just refer to that rather. 1 Timothy 6 verse 7 to 10 warns Christians concerning the dangers of money and possessions with the admonition that those who want to be rich, those who want to be rich will fall into temptation and are trapped by many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. That's verse 9. The love of wealth is one of the most frequently identified spiritual dangers in Scripture. Second is the reality of contemporary clergy living and ministering within a materialistic and consumer-driven culture. Some years back, I had a, um, one of my previous colleagues, and fantastic youth pastor he was, for sure, in one of my, our previous congregations, uh, a wonderful person. But he got a promotion. To, I say promotion. That's a promotion because he got a new church, and they wanted to build a new facility for this church, but they wanted to have shops in the ch church, like, for example, a Starbucks and a a shopping center, a, a clothing center, um, you know, all of that inside of this church. So whilst people are doing shopping, they can still watch on the monitors the service and they can feel the presence of the sanctuary. I thought to myself, that's ridiculous. Because then the focus will not be Jesus anymore, but the focus will be your shopping. I mean, <laughs> tell that to a lady. If they go to the shop, their focus is shopping. It's not church. So, so luckily that... That expansion of the ministry didn't come off, um, you know, um, from the ground. So they never built that complex, you know, with all the shops. Even again, they wanted to bring a Kentucky and McDonald's and all of that to this um, new assembly. They wanted to build um, somewhere in, in, in Johannesburg, Pretoria, between their mid ramp, you know. So you, sometimes you get caught between these two realities. Ministers find themselves trying to cope with cultural influences while proclaiming in word and deed the dangers of one of culture's most obvious idolatries. And, and that's the problem, the lust of the money. Now, the failure of economic responsibility, uh, there's plenty of evidence demonstrates how religious leaders have failed at, the, at this task by engaging in manipulation and misrepresentation to advance their own financial interests. Some of the more common and well-documented economic frauds per perpetrated by some religious leaders include embezzlements, investment scams, misappropriation of funds, and income tax ev evasions. So when somebody comes to you and they say they want you to get involved in a business, and they want you to, to think about that, pray about that, because God is going to bring a lot of money to the church, you'll just have to sign up your members. Don't do it, because that's, that's going to be really, really problem sooner or later. Clergy ministers need to be good stewards of their personal finances, resources, as well as the church wealth. A less documented but equally destructive are several other issues regarding economic ethics. Conflicts of interest can arise when ministers become financially in debt to church members. 
or others in the communities. I know a lot of pastors in the full gospel church, by the way, the church batch I'm carrying here, a lot of pastors that's, you know, borrowed money from wealthy people in the churches. And in the end, they're out of that churches and out of the members. Um, and, and it's just one big mess if you start to borrow money from church members. If they want to help you, let them give you the money, not borrow the money. Let them just give it. So it. Some clergy are tempted to maintain lifestyles for themselves and their families that, that mirror the reflection or lifestyles of affluent members of their congregation. You cannot meet up compare yourself with the Joneses. You are called man of God, a woman of God. Um, if, if they buy um, a fortune, do not think you have to buy a fortune. If, if you are driving a task, don't feel bad because you have to go and visit billionaires. Don't feel bad about that. Even Jesus was walking the streets in Jerusalem, Judea, all, all over the known world back in the day. In other cases, poor financial planning can lead to indebtedness. That is both a burden and a poor example of Christian stewardship. So many pastors, they really struggle with debt. Um, in, this, in this context, it is important to acknowledge that not every incident or, or of crushing debt is a result of poor planning. Not everything is about poor planning. Remember now, it, it doesn't say when you are in credit card debt right now that you have done poor planning. Things just happen. Things just happen, and unfortunately, things happen you know, for a good reason. Even one health crisis can, can lead to mounting debt and any number of other crises can do financially impact uh, ministers' lives. If, you're, if your car breaks down and you still have to use that car, you'll have to fix that car. It's going to cost you. So sometimes we land ourselves in debt, but it's the unforeseen things. We, we, could, we, cannot, plan fail, we cannot plan failure if something fails in your motor car. Like, like other professionals whose careers entails various levels of higher education. Ministers often finish their formal training with the burden of large student loans. Another important issue is how much ministers should give to the church and other worthy causes. So because we as the full gospel church, we are supposed to tithe to the regional office, the regional office tithe to the head office. So everybody tithes in our church. Some excuse... Um, Excuse that we do not give is minimal offerings by claiming that they are giving their entire lives to the church. So in other words, what you're saying is you do not have to pay your tithe. I'm not saying everybody needs to pay tithe because you fall under maybe a different church dogma. That's okay. But in our sense, if I preach, for example, about tithe and I do not do tithing, I cannot preach about that. I will just keep my mouth shut. I cannot teach people about my financial um, responsibilities towards the church as to, you know, I do not do it myself. You know, the preacher needs to do before he preach. While many variables influence how much ministers can and should give, the point remains that ministers should be generous towards stewards of financial and other resources. Yeah, yes, of course you give your time, but you're getting, sometimes most ministers get gets paid for their time. The temptation for religious leaders to use their power and influence to secure wealth it's an ancient problem. <clears throat> in 1 Samuel, the story of the sons of Eli begins. Now the sons of Eli, we read that in 1 Samuel 2 verse 12, the sons of Eli were squandrels. In other words, they just wasted money. They just wasted the resources. The narrative uh, clarifies this judgment by explaining that the priests, the sons of Eli, would send their servants to take by force, if necessary, meat, that had been offered as a sacrifice to God for the priest's own consumption. Now, the gravity of this offense is made clear by describing how the priests were satisfying their greed by grasping for um, that which, which was uh, being presented to God. The Bible says in 1 Samuel 12, 17, they treated the offerings of the Lord with contempt. That's actually very sad if you treat the offerings, with the things that belongs to God, if you treat it with contempt. It's a good, a good passage to read on Sunday morning. They were stealing from God and from the faithful who had given to God. And from the faithful. I mean, we've got faithful people. That's every month giving to God. But if you do not do your part as a minister of faith, and you, th you say it's only the responsibility of the congregation, of course, you would steal from them also. And many people do so still today as the sons of Eli. The excuse I had 
to do what I had to do or something I prayed and I hoped. That's a silly excuse. So you have to set up yourself some goals and uh, steam strategies, innovation, marketing, business plan, com com competition, performance. All of these strategies and goals, ideas, um, attracts money towards the church, attracts um, resources towards the church because money isn't the only resource. The point B in your, in your coursework is valves of, valves of, of poverty. At the other end of the spectrum are ministers who, along with their families, suffer from inadequate income. Something like the church pray a prayer every day. Lord, you keep him humble, we'll keep him poor. <laughs> and that's a silly prayer, but, I mean, it happens in congregations. They, they would say, the pastor needs to be poor. Now, what we have done here in our assembly many, many, many times is when, when I know that the congregation is coming to pay us a visit, at the manse here next to the church where I'm at, um, we will just take some Vaseline and we will rub the kids' mouths with Vaseline so that when the members come, they will think they, they just, the kids had some meat to eat. You know, so, so it helps a lot. <laughs> now, recent studies reveal that this problem is quite common, especially in denominations with congregational style organizations. A 2003 survey conducted by Duke University's Divinity School reveals that the median annual pay, including the value of any free housing for Protestant ministers, is $40,000. That's not a lot of money. If you include the man's, it would mean around about $2,300 a month. That is U.S. dollars now. Now, in South African currency, it would probably be around about 30,000 rands. However, 60% of Protestant pastors, remember now the first is um, the 40,000 40, bracket, but 60% of Protestant pastors serving small churches with congregational governments receive a median income of 22,300 a year. What a huge unbalance. Even in our church, I mean, there's a huge unbalance even in our church. Some pastors have to be tent makers or they have to do bivocational. In, in other words, they have dual vocation just to keep the pot on the stove. So you, if, if you earn $22,000, or for example, you earn under the bread line in your assembly, you'll have to do bivocational, and you'll have to be a tent maker in that sense. Now, in these cases, churches that can afford to provide adequate compensation to their ministers need to be challenged to meet their responsibility. We need to challenge our members. We need to challenge people in our churches to support the ministry. In, in, in his sermon, The Use of Money, John Wesley contended that Christians should gain all you can, save all you can, and give all you can. That was John Wesley that said that. Wesley thus avoids both the view that money is inherently evil and the correlative notion that the vow of poverty is an essential part of the minister's call. He goes on to warn what is gaining wealth. Christians should neither harm one's neighbor nor one's own spiritual integrity through gaining wealth. The charge to save all you can reminds us that we are not to spend all we can, but to save all we can. Wesley contends that Christians should be frugal and consume only what plain nature requires. At the same time, we should be especially alert to the reality that being appropriately satisfied can overcome inordinate desires in our lives. Now, the call to give uh, all we can explains the reason for gaining and saving. Now, this call is a reminder, is a reminder that we are not proprietors or owners, but we are stewards. This may be important, but um, I guess you, you will get something like that. Responsible ministers should commit their wealth to meeting the needs of those for whom they are immediately responsible. And then, as resources and opportunities allow the needs of humanity. But if, if any provide, and this is the Bible now speaking here, 1 Timothy 5 verse 8, it's a, it's, it's, it's a book written to Timothy from Paul. If any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he have to Denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. Can you, can you see that? 
So, so Paul was very strict on this, that you, would, you should be able to provide for your own house. And if you do not, you're worse than an infidel. Along with every other member of the congregation, ministers bear the responsibility to financially support ministries of the church with their ties as well as their offerings. Now, in our church, there's, we've got a good model going for the past, I think, 20 years. So if, I, if my congregation pays 10,000, I'm just using a round number now. I wish we could have been at 10,000 every single month. But if we pay 10,000 rands tithes, it means we, we earned 100,000 for the, for the month. If we pay 10,000 tithes to the HQ, 20% of that tithe goes into the pension fund of the pastor, the local pastor of that assembly. 20%, another 20% goes back to the region if you pay your tithe on time. And that 20% at the region are divided between the elderly pastors, the ones who retired, the pastor's wives, maybe their husbands died. They will get something from the, from the HQ that the HQ sent back to the regional office. And, and, and also, it's just a fragment of about 40% because there's also another pastoral fund uh, that tithing fund is support at HQ. So you can also apply for assistance from our HQ, but they only give so much for every year, financial year. And then about 30% or something like that gets into the administration of the church. So in giving, ministers can bear witness to a responsible stewardship of wealth. Now, John Richard Neaus reminds ministers that most do not sell out by making crooked deals or even by consciously <clears throat> promising um, principle in order not to compromise financial security. We pay our tribute to Mammon in the minutes and hours spent in worrying about money and the things that money can get. The question of money and the dangers is it poses should be kept under the closest scrutiny. <clears throat> Excuse me. Ministers should remember that obsession with money, whether in grasping for too much or worrying about too little, can become a corrosive spiritual poison. As Proverbs teaches, remove far from me falsehood and lying. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food that I need, or I shall be full and deny you and, I, and say, Who is the Lord? Or I shall be poor and still and profane the name of my God. Some time back, I had a conversation with one of the pastors here in town. And I, we talked about offering and tithing and so on in our meeting. And he said he, he doesn't require from his congregation any tithing or offering. They don't even have offering baskets. I say to him, but how do you finance your congregation? He said, they don't need finance because they've got a business running on the side. So that business supports what they are doing here and in church. I said, but you are... You are robbing the people then. You are robbing the people. You shouldn't rob the people because they should know that they should be able to give unto the work of the Lord. So some time back, I went back for a visit and I saw that he had some offering baskets in his church. So um, Red Ader said, if you think hiring a professional is expensive, wait till you hire an amateur. I'm saying it again. If you think hiring a professional is expensive, wait while you hire an amateur. It will cost you a lot more. Excuse me. Now, Minister Economic economic Covenant, you'll find that on page, page 38. Um, I've, I've done some church answers and questions. I've got a, a big list of things here I wanted to share with you. Um, let me just see if I want to... Six reasons why many full-time pastors will soon be part-time. I wonder if I, if I want to... Show you this. Let me just see if I can get to that slide. Excuse me. I'm sorry because of this sinus and it's killing me, man. Um, we are on that page. Let me just see. I just want to show you something real quick on Google. Google is a great tool. You can use it to your advantage or to your disadvantage, of course. Um, if you go to church questions, dot com, um, church answers, I mean, dot com, you'll find a lot of good material there. I, I came upon this, I stumbled upon this six reasons why many full-time pastors will be part-time soon. I'm just going to read out real quick 
just not to waste your time, is by Tom S. Rayner. You can always study his thing. Um, now, there's six, six reasons six reasons why many full-time pastors will soon be part-time. He said in his study, declining church income, that's number, reason number one. Number two, the pandemic caused pastors to reevaluate their priorities. Number three, greater priority on their families. Number four, techno technology and side gigs have made one part vocations more accessible. Number five, there is a growing trend of hiring part-time staff or hybrid people, you know, people that's able to travel and do more than one job. You can, like, for example, I, maybe some of you don't know, but I'll be immigrating to the United States shortly, but um, we, we've got a congregation there that's been running for many years, 70 or 80 years, and they've called us there in Illinois. But our regional congregations close to our house, um, most of them, they've got one pastor pastoring three churches. One pastor pastoring three churches because of the declining church income, declining church membership, it's, it's, it's just ridiculous. I mean, so there's, so there's a greater trend of hiring a part-time pastor now these days. But you will just come in on Sunday morning from 9 to 10, you preach the gospel, you go to another church from um, 11 to 12, you preach the, the same message again, <laughs> and then you go to another church, you preach the same message again. You'll be tired, but that's the way things are going right now. Many pastors desire not to be dependent on the church for their income. They do not desire to be dependent. And, and I guess that's, that's the danger of that. Because let me tell you that I've been in that position for, for many, many years that I've tried to be independent of, um, you know, of, my, of church salaries. And, it's, you know, you're robbing the people of their blessings. You're, you're robbing the people of, of their blessings. So for the ministers, economic covenant, you can say, I will be honest in my stewardship of money. This is your commandments. This is commandments for you as a person. Um, I will live within my income and not become hampered by unpaid debts. Unfortunately, many people, they will be stressed out because of their unpaid debts. You know, there's some things you cannot control, and that's your debtors. You're, the only way to control your debtors is by, you know, money. <laughs> you can control them only by your money or by white paper. Um, make an arrangement and tell them, listen, here is an arrangement. Uh, please, excuse me this month. I will pay you next month um, and I'll pay a double payment. I've sat with one of our church members in the previous congregation some time back. He had a pavement company and as I was sitting and ministering to me, he had a call and he said to me, Pastor, I need to take this call really, really urgent. He knows the people he was phoning. And, and I, I listened to what he was telling the per person on the other side. And he said, yes, but I told you, next month is your turn. <laughs> so he was telling this debtor, next month is your turn. This turn not, not this month. I will exercise a lifestyle consistent with the life and teachings of Christ. I will also need, um, I will not seek special um, gratuities, um, privileges, bequests or loans because of my role as minister. In other words, you will not pull on your rank. And many people in government, they will pull on their rank of special um, gratuities or privileges uh, that the normal person won't get. I will not become involved in funeral or marriage schemes or any other schemes for that matter that seek to profit from the performance of my ministerial duties. Many pastors, they've become involved with these schemes, funeral and marriage schemes, and they will only use certain people. And we had a pastor living close to us in our previous house, in previous church, and he was pastor on call. He was doing marriages, marriages, and all of that. And, and, and he was running after that. He didn't care for the people. He didn't even know most of the people, but he just cared for, you know, this marriage scheme of his. Or, and I will advocate adequate financial compensation for my profession, including the entire church staff. So you do not work only for yourself in your church. You are speaking about money. You are teaching the people about money, not just before, because of you, but for the old staff of the church. I will generous, I'll be generous in my stewardship of, of my money, contributing to the ministries of the church and the needs 
of humanity with the tithes and offerings. Now, for the church, there's also a commitment for them in your study. You can use that from the pulpit on Sunday. We will practice good stewardship in a spirit of kindness and generosity. We understand that workers are worthy of their hire and will compensate with fairness and generosity. God cannot bless somebody that doesn't keep at the, you know, by the word of God. This is scriptural. Three, we will stay aware of rising costs for insurance and other living expenses in our culture and plan our compensation accordingly. In other words, they will plan the compensation for the pastor and the leadership teams that's on the payroll accordingly. We will not become enablers of a minister's poor habits or poor discipline by making loans or gifts beyond reason or extenuating circumstances. So please, if you have to make a loan for the church, be very careful for that because loans put you in trouble. I, I cannot remember even if I had, I think we had one loan, my entire ministry of 27 years, we had one loan in a previous church for the air conditions and good conditioners inside of the church. It took us five years to pay it off. They charged us a lot of interest. A lot of money was paid due to interest. We will also offer help by way of financial counseling and mentoring if needed, but will not try into the private matters of our ministers because it's a private situation. They're not supposed to look over your shoulder. Now, the next point is sexual conduct. Also a very interesting part of the work. If you want to take a break, that's okay. You can just pause the video here, and then you can take your break. Now, let's move on. I think you don't need a pause right now. Um, now, <clears throat> extent of the problem, because the, it's a big problem, sexual misconduct inside of the, you know, the church realm. One of the most destructive moral failures by clergy is not money, but it's sexual misconduct. There was a study done a couple of years back that found that most pastors who had moral failures had it on Mondays. Can you believe that? I mean, why would they have it on Mondays? Because they had this high on sun Sunday because of the movement of God, and all of a su sudden they're tired and they're weak. And most moral failures have been committed on Mondays. So that's why most pastors would take off on Mondays and not on Fridays. They will take their rest on Mondays because of this dilemma we are facing. Also, some years back, a certain church at their international conference in an area uh, or a certain area or a town. And after this conference, a study was done by the Barna Association and found that 40% of the pastors was watching porn and pornography. In that, in that hotel. They've monitored a couple of hotels in the city where that pastoral conference was at. I'm not going to say the church's name because I don't know the church. <laughs> so, But the fact is, 40% of every person in that hotel, pastors, because it was book, uh, blocked out, booked out by the pastoral conference, they were watching pornography. And the problem with that is you have to pay for that. So in other words, you have to phone the front desk and say, hey, man, just open channel 123, please. Thank you. Just build my car. Thank you. Bye-bye. Poof, put the phone down. They build this car. They give them pornography. The damage caused by this failure spreads like a virus throughout the church, devastating families and individuals. So now can you see why so many church members, you know, they are struggling with pornography because of clergy people are struggling with pornography. Extent of the problem um, uh, sexual failures are often headline news. I mean, we can mention a couple of them, but I don't like to do that. But implicating clergy in all religious bodies. Because if, if one of us, we, we become unfaithful, all of us are unfaithful. We see some headlines from across the board, from Hillsong to No Song. <laughs> can he, from Hillsong to No Song. Careful studies over several decades, decades, have attempted to understand both the causes and extent of the problem. In one study, questionnaires were sent to 1,000 pastors in six southern states. Now, you know what's a southern state? It's a state um, below, not below income or below what, but it's the bottom part of the United States. It's the Christian states. The southern states are more Christian 
There's more Baptist church in in the southern United States than probably in Africa. There's a lot of ba- uh, you know big churches in southern states. Of those responding of that four uh, one thousand pastors, fourteen point one percent acknowledge inappropriate sexual contact in their ministries. Yeah, fourteen percent of one thousand means you know it's about one hundred and forty people. Huh? It's a lot. Now. They also said that 70.4% said they knew of some other minister's sexual failings. So 70% of them, they knew about somebody's failing. And I mean, if we talk to one another, you would probably mention to me, yes, you know about a pastor that committed a moral failure. 24.2% reported that they had counseled at least one person who claimed to have had sexual contact with a minister. That's a lot, 24.2% of them. So it, it saddens my heart, but other studies indicate similar results among clergy within a wide range of religious groups all over the spectrum. There are four recognized expressions of sexual misconduct by ministers. Sexual relations outside of marriage, unwanted or inappropriate physical contact, I'm just laughing at these things these days because I'm so happy. I do not know if some of the other pastors would agree with me that the kissing in the Pentecostal movement has gone away. Huh? Hallelujah. Remember the day when the pastor would stand at the door and he would need to kiss everybody that's passing. <laughs> it was horrible. Well, I stopped it when I became a pastor and they want, uh, I was still a youth pastor and and, and when I have to greet people at the door, because when the pastor's not there, I take the I take the pulpit, and then I have to go and greet people. And some of the ladies would do this, you know. I'll just do this. <laughs> I I stopped the kissing many many years back. It's dangerous. It's very dangerous to start kissing and touching and in the church. I mean, it's it's not appropriate. Other sexually oriented or suggestive uh, suggestive. Behaviors, including sexual or sexually uh, suggestive speech and gestures, like for example, you you've got a tight butt, you know, mm, it looks good. Some other pastor the other day, I've I've done it here myself, but somebody told me about that. He said to a lady coming into his church, "My goodness, I would grab those." You know what I mean? That is inappropriate for a pastor to speak like that. Any man, man or woman of God. The use of pornography also becomes a real big problem. This is the four recognized expressions of sexual misconduct by ministers. We should be we, need, we should be clean vessels. The Lord cannot use us if we have these failures in our lives. The problem of ministerial sexual misconduct is not just a problem or a modern problem, but has plagued the people of God throughout history. Problems with or arising from improper sexual relationships after reflected. In the stories of Abram, Lot, Samson, David, Solomon. Oh, so there's so many people in the Bible, just to mention these five. And in, the, in this context as well, the sons of Eli are described as squandrels in 1 Samuel 2 verse 12, where it says, Now Eli was very old. He heard all that his sons were doing to all Israel and how they lay with the woman who served at the entrance to the tent of meeting. Excuse me. So there was a woman serving, not serving food, gents, ladies. They were not serving food. They were serving other stuff at the tent of meeting, the holy place. Now, as I speak, probably we, we have two, two churches right here. On this corner is one. On the next corner is another one. But we had a lot of prostitution in the streets, a lot. Until we have, you know, come with street evangelism, then they just run away. We, we march these blocks all over the city, so we do not see them so often anymore. But they're, they sometimes they'll take their chances. Right here in front of churches, I mean, why do you, the, the Bible says, He said to them, why do you do such things? For I hear of your evil dealings from all these people. So what happened was that the people of um, Israel, they groaned and moaned before God because of the corruption, you know, in the ministerial integrity. The corruption 
the evil inside of ministerial integrity. Now, what's the expression of the problem? Yelis again, of course, questions continues to haunt us. Recent studies suggest that there are at least four contributing factors expressing the problem. First one is abuse of power. Seems to be the most prevalent factor in clergy, sexual misconduct. So they, they use their power as the pastor and say, you are the Sunday school superintendent, you must have coffee with me today. We have a meeting or something like that. Let's drive to a meeting or let's go and eat something in lunchtime. In a culture in which a dominant understanding of sexual relations is, con is conquest, clergy are tempted to use their status and power to conquer sexually. And that's very sad. Very, very sad. Also, sex, sexual addiction um, is increasingly recognized as a factor in appropriate, inappropriate behaviors of ministers. Compulsive behaviors are often the result of a serious personality disorder in which there is a recurrent failure to control behaviors, even in the face of undesirable consequences. Even if they know this is, you know, they will be scratching their name from the, from the church's website and from everywhere else. They won't be on call anymore because of this sin they've done. One of the deep tragedies of sexual addiction is that many affected ministers seem to have entered the ministry in the attempt to overcome their addictive ten tendencies. What is very sad for me personally was back in the day when um, I was still in theological seminary, we had six addicts studying with us. People, youngsters, that will be, you know, running after sexual, you know, after their sexual desires. It's actually horrible to know that if you're called of God, you should be called of God. Then also misinterpretation of intimate relationships. Many clergy relationships, especially counseling relationships, involve some degree of intimacy. A recurring temptation is to allow such relationship to, to extend beyond appropriate boundaries. This is not a God thing because God doesn't want us to, to, to live like this. We shouldn't misrepresent our relationships. Now, this is where problem starts when you come to your church office and tell your, tell your secretary, um, listen, yeah, um, Pastor, why are you feeling well? Uh, my wife, you know, my wife, my wife, this and my wife, that. Oh, Pastor, don't worry. Don't worry, Pastor. Tomorrow is both shoulders and tomorrow is, oh, don't worry, Pastor. Watch out for this kind of misrepresentation of your intimate relationship. It's nothing to do with the office. It's nothing to do with what's going on here, right? That's what, it's actually a good thing I'm here in the, in the office. It's nothing to do with them. And also, another expression of the problem is stress or burnout. It, it, burnout is common. It's a common experience for ministers. Weakened by exhaustion. Clergy become more vulnerable to temptation in the midst of burnout. The schedule, a causal factor was identified as prevalent in the study of sexual misconduct of the pastors cited above. So you can be careful. If you are experiencing burnout right now, you should just step down for a while, maybe enjoy two weekends off from the pulpit, maybe three. Um, if you have enough leave, take a sabbatical, but just get out for a while and just refresh yourself before God. Because burnout will result in a lot of other people will, that will go down with you. If this building burns down, everybody inside of it will be destroyed. So if you as the pastor or as the, the head of the department you're leading or the, the school you're leading are in a burnout situation, everybody's going to feel the effect of that burnout. So be careful for that. Then point C, dealing with sexuality. Prevention is the first the defense against the damage inflicted by sexual misconduct. And ministers can take several basic steps to enhance prevention. And you should employ these prevention methods. Now, ministers must understand that they are called to be servants, not rulers. We are servants, not rulers. Jesus even came with a towel, not with a title. Their power is a gift from God to be used in healing, not in conquering. Secondly, ministers must... Nurture and protect their family. Your family is number one. Honest discussions of sexual needs with spouses are essential. Counseling may be needed. And ministers and their spouses should not be stigmatized for availing themselves 
of therapeutic help. So we should report, if we need the help, we should report that we need this help. Also, boundaries in counseling. Ministers should observe clearly stated standards regarding boundaries in counseling and, and other forms of pastoral ministry to minimize misinterpretation um, and um, temptations. Ministers must be aware of their own hearts also. Uh, we, we all have a inside, we've got a heart, their own vulnerabilities and their strengths and must nurture a deep relationship with God. Extramarital sexual sins are not only against the spouse, the partner, the family, and the church, but also violate our relationship with the Lord. You will not get away with that. So you'll have to respect all of that because it's a violation against the word of God and against your father God. And also careful attention to be to the biblical admo admonitions concerning sexual conduct. And misconduct can help ministers through times of weakness and vulnerability. Ministers must not allow um, rationalizing, denial, compromising, or justifying cloudy their vision of the biblical standard of faithfulness in marriage and celibacy in singleness. Having a trusted friend or mentor with whom confidentiality is assured, truth is forthright spoken inside of that con in, 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 in that relationship. And accountability is held high with will also help ministers to um, to, to live faithfully. So if you can find that friend or mentor, it's like a call a buddy thing, you know. If you if you feel you're going to have a moral failure, you phone your buddy, say, Marnie, man, I, I've got a real big problem. Would you pray with me, please? I, yeah, she's sitting right here in front of me. Please help me, buddy. <laughs> get out of there, Monet, get out of there. That's that's how we help each other. So you have to find yourself a buddy to help you through this different, difficult situation. Ministers should focus not only on sexual sins, but also on the truth that our sexuality is a gift from God. The minister's task is to pro proclaim by word and deed that we are to be good stewards of this good gift, though and uh, within the intimacy of marriage. Yeah. What about the covenant? You can find this on page 43. After every close of a certain um, subject, we have um, for the minister's covenant as well as for the assembly or the church's covenant. Now, for the minister, you can always preach on this on the men's camp or a woman's camp so that people would know that they would need to covenant with God. I will recognize that sexuality is God's gift, which can be used for both good and evil. This is the first covenant. Second one, I will clearly demonstrate a life of sexual fidelity, fidelity and integrity in all of my relationships and a steadfast commitment to the biblical standard of faithfulness in marriage and celibacy in singleness. Thirdly, I will not allow sexuality to become the driving force of any of my of my um where, where, where I know, of my life. Nothing in my life. I will commit myself to constructive counseling in the event that my sexuality is expressed inappropriately. Um so, yeah, over there. Now, for the church, they can also commit to this covenant. They can say, we recognize we are sexual beings before God and that our sexuality is an arena for Christian witness and discipleship. We will commit ourselves to exhibiting wholesome sexual relationships among ourselves, within our families, and beyond the church family. We will commit ourselves to forming relationships, time structures, and ministry activities so that our ministers can build wholesome family relationships. That's the point. Well, any questions so far? We still have one subject to cover on, on, on ministry, ministerial ethics. I wish we can finish by the, tonight. Yeah, I think maybe if you give me another 20 minutes or so, we'll be finished with our ministerial ethics. Is that okay? All right, let's take a short, short, short break. Okay, let's do that. Um, you can run to the loo, you can do your thing, and um, then, of course, come back real quick so that we can enter into our session. So the next section is point eight in your study manual or in your curriculum. Um, that is the minister and the community. The minister plays a vital part in the community because your face is the face of the church inside of the community. When they see you, they see the church. 
Effective responsible ministers see their churches. Oops, I didn't share my screen. I'm sorry. Let me just do that real quick. Uh, there we go. Right. So effective responsible ministers see their churches as integral um, parts of the community. The false uh, dichotomy of us versus them between church and the community gives way to the realization that we are them. We are the community. We are them. Um, even Jesus taught his followers to be salt and light in the world. He told them, you should be the salt and the light. He didn't say, Jesus didn't say, I'll be the light and the salt of the world. He says in Matthew 5, 16, let your light shine before others. He didn't say, let my light shine for others. So that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. Implicit in Jesus' teaching is that the good deeds that bring glory to God should be done in the community. Jesus also told the disciples that others would identify his followers by the love they had for one another. This is to say the, in, the central ideas of unity and community were built into the framework of discipleship. Jesus involved himself in the community at weddings, dinners, healings, feedings, and funerals. The Gospels confirm that Jesus went to, to these events not to show off, but to meet the people's needs in the very places where they gathered. So, so if you are responsible for a wedding, you know, mingle with the people. Do not stand there in the corner and make as if you're untouchable and, you know, you're too holy for this people. Mingle with the people. Don't do what they do. They do silly things on marriages. You know, just touch base with them. Even when we have a funeral in our church here, um, and I, I don't know the people most of the times because you, if you bury or if you only bury the people in your church, you, you're gonna have no burials maybe in, in two three years. <laughs> I don't. I can't even remember when we buried. Oh yes, we buried one last year. So, um, but most of the bur um, funerals here in this church is from people that do not have a church. So, so what I'll do is I'll just mingle with the people in the hall afterwards while, we, whilst we're drinking tea. I, I won't run to my house and hide away from them. I want to connect with them. Effective and ethic, ethical ministers will do the same in their own communities, both through their personal involvement and through the involvement of their um, church family or their church families. Uh, the Apostle Paul encourages community building, involvement and meetings, needs, and doing so with the highest of ethical standards. Now, the book of Philemon, he comes to Philemon and he says to Philemon, hey man, finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence and if anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. So in other words, he says, if you find something you can do good, do it. Don't hide away from it. Take that responsibility, dwell on these things, dwell on the good things. He continues when he says, the things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me. Practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. Now we're reading from Colossians, verses 3, verse 5 to 11. But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at last you have revived your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned before but you lacked opportunity to do good, of course. In fact, even every Pauline epistle appeals directly or indirectly for conduct, befitting the name and nature of Christ. Paul affirms, Paul affirms Jesus' this, this depiction of his followers as in the world, but not of the world, John 17, verse 15 to 16, and expresses the communal scope of, of this image. Throughout the scope of Christian history, churches have related to their com communities in a variety of ways, ranging from total non-involvement to total absorption. Ethical and effective ministers attempt to strike a healthy balance between the involvement and this effectiveness by discovering ways of connecting with the world. This balance may include praying and working for the community to adopt more Christ-like attitudes. And actions, for example, regarding race, uh, uh, race relations, um, gambling, substance abuse, sexual morality, um, business ethics, and 
and ju social justice. These are things you can get involved with in the community. Ministers should also relate to people in the community on very human levels. For example, the school, the plays and um, concerts, local sports teams, um, community theater, local politics. So there's a lot of space inside of your community you can get involved with. Do not be excluded. Um, be inclusive with, with everybody. Invite them to your church. Let them come and, uh, and, you know, get out there and play sports with them if you have to. Ministers who involve themselves and the churches in the communities open several doors from which the gospel may move into the life of the community. And the community can come into the life of the, of, of the church. So there's many people that will not come to church, but you can take the church to them. Because if you're two or three that gathers, the Bible says, there I'll, I'll be in their midst. In other words, there is the church. As ministers involve themselves with the community, they rediscover issues on the hearts and minds of the people. They listen to the people. They hear their requests. You can stop the game for a minute and pray about a situation. If somebody got bad news in the community. You pray about the situation. You cover them with prayers. They also see critical ministries um, uh, church, excuse me, that the churches are uniquely uh, positions, a uh, position to provide, for example, addiction recovery groups um, that can meet in your sanctuary on Thursday, close closets in the church, the welfare, food pantries, prison ministries, habit, habitat, habitat um, for humanity, um, business, chaplaincy, and so on and so forth, and community activities that churches may choose to house or sponsor, for example, civic clubs sport leagues, community theater, arts development, um, PTA groups, cultural activities, and senior groups. Um, and here in South Africa, we call it the, the sector policing groups. Yeah, you know, you can always give them a, a space to meet once a month or so. Um, it is at these levels of connecting with people, their needs, and their interests that then church is most relevant uh, and a life in embo um, em embodying the love of Christ. Ministers who closely follow the way of Jesus not only acquire skills in preaching and writing, witnessing, planning, and leading, but also connect deeply with the lead hearts and hurts of the broken people in our broken world. Community involvement is an arena in which the skills of preaching, teaching, and witnessing, planning, and leading are polished with the gift of reality and so reflecting brightly the light of the world. Now, this is the light that you'll have to shine for your witnessing outside in the dark world. For ministers and churches, we need to commit ourselves to, 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 to this. We should be committed in our conduct. Um, yes, um, what is this? Let me just close this order here. Just a minute. But in any case, let's just move on. For ministers and churches, we will value the the larger community beyond the reference point of our local congregation, reaching out to people who may never be members of our church and caring about important issues which may not directly impact our church members. Now, I've, 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 I've got more members in the world than I've got members in the church. Um, my members is predominantly somewhere in the world. <laughs> they are all over the world and all over the place. And I must say, I, I do not mind that because, you know, um, we work with the kingdom of God. We work with his kingdom, not with the human kingdom. So I lost my place now. Okay, let's do this. We shall endeavor to, to know and be known in the communities that we serve as witnesses to the love of Christ to meet physical, emotional, and spiritual needs. Now, the question I want to ask is, will the community realize the church has been raptured? Or only the members? Can you just let this sink in a little bit? Um, would you, if the community pass here every single day inside of the street, on side, you know, and, and they see no movement anymore, would they think, oh my goodness, I wonder where these people at? Or would they know immediately that you're gone, you're raptured? We shall look deeply into the communities in which we serve to understand and minister to their needs and concerns and to rejoice in their, in their triumphs. Now, the summation of all of this is the covenant of ministerial ethics calls minister to the lifelong commitment of integrity and wholeness in Jesus Christ and to live as children of the light. 
according to Ephesians 4, um, verses 8 to 14, as they serve God and the congregations. Remember, you serve God and then your congregation. The covenant affirms the credibility, that credibility and effectiveness in ministry is primarily built on the faithfulness and truthfulness of the minister, according to 2 Timothy 2, verse 15. The preceding essays on ministerial ethics provide biblical and theological foundations, address crucial areas of ministerial ethics, and offer guidance and direction for coping with the ethical demands of ministry. At the conclusion of the essays, addressing specific ethic, ethical concerns are covenants of, of accountability which focus on relevant commitments for ministers and congregations. The essay and covenants provide material for further reflection and can serve as a resource for discussion between ministers and congregations. The following covenant of ministerial ethics condenses the pre preceding essays and biblical material into a framework for living and ministering with ethical integrity. We strongly encourage ministers to sign this covenant and use it as a guide for their lives and work. We urge that a signed copy of the covenant be kept by the minister and distributed to church leaders, your friends maybe. We suggest that the church publish the covenant as a way of cultivating confidence that the ministers of the church are committed to integrity and accountability in their lives as well as their ministries. So that's good to have such a covenant with your congregation. What about the theological foundation about that? Now, Bereth, the Hebrew word for covenant, is one of the key words and concepts in Scripture. It appears at least 286 times in the Old Testament and is a central unifying theme in the Bible. The basic biblical meaning of covenant is a contract, a pact, or a promise, alliance, or agreement which binds together the covenanting parties. And you remember that God made a covenant with Abram? I do. But before Abram was covenanted, God gave him an instruction to move somewhere. One of the dis distinguishing characteristics of God, and this will be in your test, in Scripture is displayed in the stories of God's determination to enter the, into covenants with humankind. In Genesis 9, once again, God covenants with Noah. Genesis 9, verses 9 to 17, with the Divine promise never to repeat the flood. A few chapters earlier, or later, excuse me, God enters into a solemn covenant with Abram. When he was, his name was still regular Abram. Chapter Genesis 15, 18, on the day, on that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying to your descendants, I have given this land from the river of Egypt as far as the great river, the river Euphrates. You can also read chapter 17, verse 2, promising land, descendants, and the blessing. In the New Testament, Jesus uses the bread and the cup at the Last Supper as symbols of the new covenant embodied in his life, death, and resurrection. Covenants always entail responsibilities for at least one of the covenant partners. This will also be in your test. The people of Israel were called by God in Exodus 19, verses 4 to 6, to obey my voice and keep my covenant. So we are to, you know, to hold to this covenant, the responsibility of this covenant. Then the people would be my treasure, possession, a priestly kingdom, a holy nation, ministers, and the congregation. You know, they, they serve, they serve, accept similar responsibilities of faithfulness, and blessings as churches seek to minister in Jesus' name. The concept of faithfulness is deeply connected to covenant. You can read with me Jeremiah 14, verse 21. Do not despise us for your own name's sake. Do not disgrace the throne of your glory. Remember and do not annul your covenant with us. So God's got the right to annul this covenant, but he chooses not to. The word faithful, which, which means steadfast, dedicated, dependable, and worthy of trust is used to describe the relationship between God and Israel. According to Deuteronomy 7 verse 9, it says, God maintains covenant loyalty with those who love Him. 
and keep His commandments. Even in 1 Corinthians 7, 25, 5, Paul offers pastoral counsel to the Corinthian congregation as a trustworthy minister. Now, built upon fidelity, the covenant between ministers and congregations is not static code, but the living and dynamic relationship. It's up and down. Jeremiah describes the internal nature of such a covenant, which is which is um, its heart and soul, when he says in Jeremiah 31, verses 31 to 33, he says, The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with, these, with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. I will put my law within them, or inside of us, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Now, a covenant of ministerial ethics moves beyond external restraints, like rules posted on the employee bulletin or to, to the incarnation of ministerial integrity into relationships. This part will be in your test. Authentic Christian ministries, ministry develops and nurture healthy relationships between ministers and congregations. The standard by which ministers and congregations should be measured is not um, secular uh, success, but by faithfulness to the covenant of ministerial ethics and the relationships uh, which are the fruit of the covenant deity. We're almost that close. This will be the last slide, so let's just give it our best. Now, covenant of ministerial ethics for the minister. Um, the preamble states as follows, as a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ, called by God's grace. Now, you can... Copy and paste this in your own time, if you will, and, and make it your own. Because you can create your own covenant with the assembly. As a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ, called by God's grace through God's providence and purpose for my life and gifted by the Spirit for equipping the church, I commit myself to in, incarnate the biblical understanding of ministry and the ethical precepts that are um, contained in this covenant in order that my ministry might be fruitfully reflect Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. As the congregation served uh, by this minister, we commit ourselves to embody the promises contained in the covenant so that we might faithfully reflect the way of Jesus in our ministry to one another and the world. For the minister, I will reflect the integrity of the gospel of Jesus Christ in my, in my ministry by leading the congregation to follow Jesus, so becoming the salt of the earth and the light of the world, loving an, um, our enemies, becoming agents of reconciliation, doing justice for the least of these, speaking the truth in love, loving God as we love one another, and serving God as we serve also one another. I will respond to the call of Christ within faithful obedience and count it a joyful privilege to be asked to serve in ministry. I will be, thirdly, I will be intentional in nursing, excuse me, nurturing relationships with families, friends, and colleagues, and members of the congregation. I recognize the importance of building healthy relationships, which are both open and honest and free from coercion, deception, manipulation, and the abuse of power of my position. Number four, I will commit, I will be committed to the faithful stewardship of time. I will be disciplined in my use of time, which includes not wasting time or working at all times. I will take time for spiritual formation, study prayer, um, faithful, um, excuse me, family and rest. Number five, I will develop a healthy lifestyle, which includes my spiritual, physical and emotional health. I will be financially responsible, which, um, which responsibility includes paying my bills avoiding financial favors, um, living within my salary, contributing to financial support of my church and other ministries, and adopting a lifestyle consistent with biblical teachings concerning um, position and money. I will clearly demonstrate, number seven now, a life of sexual fidelity and integrity in all of my relationships and a commitment to the biblical standard of faithfulness in marriage and celibacy in singleness. Number eight, I will participate in the larger community as the context of my ministry. I will be committed to the issue of justice, compassion, reconciliation, and to the uh, marginalized as I value all of God's children. I also will, number nine, will direct 
I will be directed in all that I do by Jesus' vision in the model prayer. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as is in heaven. I will be dedicated to God's sovereign role and reign in every area of my life and be faithful in announcing that God's kingdom has come in Jesus Christ. So this is a commitment. This is a covenant. You can print it out, sign on it, and tell your congregation, listen, all your students, this is my commitment to you. They will respect that. They will hold you accountable, you know, and they'll say, yeah, listen, man, give it to one of your partners in ministry. Let them remind you about your covenant towards the church and towards God's work. Now, for the church, on the other hand, they can also covenant with you, and they can you can keep this on your record, and, and you can, you know, when people covenant, they think twice before they leave. You know, um, for example, in suicide prevention and chaplaincy, you will, you will see later that you also covenant with a possible suicidal person where they covenant with you and say, before I try anything, I will phone you. And they sign. Now, we will honor the congregation, the church now. We will honor and respect the call of God in the lives of our ministers and count their service among us as a gift from God. It's a two-way street now. Eh? We will commit our, ourselves to forming relationships, time structures, and ministry activities so that our ministers can build on some family relationships. Number three, we will respect our ministers, families, and honor them as vital parts of our team. Number four, we will commit to develop and nurture strong relationships with the congregation and show we are Christians by our love. Number five, we will recognize our minister's need for rest and time to be away from work. We will protect their time to have a day off and their family time. Number six, we will recognize our own and our minister's needs for spiritual formation and physical well-being. Number seven, we understand that Workers are worthy of their hire and will compensate ministers with fairness and generosity. Number eight, we will commit ourselves to exhibiting faithful and wholesome sexual relationships among ourselves, within our families, and beyond the church family. Number nine, we will endeavor to know and be known in the communities that we serve as witnesses to the love of Christ who meets physical, emotional, and spiritual needs. Now, this is a two-way street covenant. So the covenant the pastor or the clergy makes or the leader of the pack, and then, of course, your, um, your, your family or maybe your students or the church in this regard. Well, hmm, we are finished with our class. That's good. That's real good. Now, mm -hmm. read your course workbook, at least, if you can. Pass the test. That's, that's a good idea. Um, if you pass the test, you are halfway on. Well, thank you for being here. Is there any questions? It's a, this was a mouthful. <laughs> this was really a mouthful. I must say, I wish I had this information when I was just starting ministry decades ago. You know, it would have been such a blessing and a joy. I would have let every member sign this commitment. <laughs> As soon as they want to volunteer in the church or maybe if they want to minister or whatever the case may be, if they come to membership to the church, I would have made this commitment with them. But in any case, um, this is always a good idea to start afresh with this. All right. If there's no questions, I'll leave you there. Then you can go to bed. Well, good night, everybody. Thank you, Yala. Welcome. Thank you, Have a good night.